I'm Cynthia James, and this network is about changing lives one woman at a time. Welcome to Women Awakening. I'm your host, Cynthia James. I am so excited and honored, actually, that I get to introduce you to spectacular women, women who've taken control in their lives, women who stepped up and said, I want to bring my voice. I want to bring my light. I want to bring my gifts to this planet. And I bring these women to you because I want you to know that they are not, you know, extraordinary examples. They are, they are way showers to tell you, you live in a world of possibilities. You live in a world where you get to bring your light. So uh, I'm grateful that you're here. I do these every week. So you can come back. We're on Spotify, iTunes, iHeart, Spreaker, Amazon, and video on YouTube. So check out Women Awakening and and meet another woman and be inspired. Guaranteed, guaranteed, guaranteed. (laughs) So I want to introduce you to my guest today. Anastasia Zadek. She, I want to tell you what someone said about her. Anastasia is elegant, honest, and passionate about telling the hardest stories to tell. Mm-hmm. I just think that that's a spectacular beginning. Anastasia is a writer. She's an editor. She's a storyteller. And after graduating summa cum laude from Smith College with a degree in psychology, She had an international career in neuropsychological research while she was raising her children. She now serves as director of operations for the San Diego Writers Festival and as a board member for the literary nonprofit So Say We All. She's a frequent performer at narrative nonfiction in a hushed bar. We're going to talk about that. (laughs) And her work has appeared in the San Diego the Cameron Project, Literary Vine Review, and the award-winning anthology, Shaken the Tree, Short Brazen Memoir. Blurred Fates is her first novel. Anastasia, thank you so much for being here. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for having me. This is such a treat. Well, first of all, I just want to start with where you grew up, how you grew up, you know, because I'm sure you didn't just drop on the planet and go, well, I'm going to be an author and I'm going to be a storyteller. Not at all. Um, Although I will say that I grew to be a storyteller very quickly. Um, I grew up in um, a suburb of Chicago. I was actually born in New York. We lived for a short time in Indiana, and then from the, from five to eighteen, I lived in a small town called Mount Prospect, Illinois, which, believe it or not, had no mountains, but it was called Mount Prospect. Uh, and uh, I, I was the fourth of five children. My parents were strong believers in uh, giving back to the community. We had foster children while I was growing up, so there was often there was always at least five and sometimes six kids sitting around the table. And my parents had a tradition of giving us each three minutes, which was quite liberal at the time, given that there was five of us, that meant 15 minutes to tell the most interesting or important thing that happened to us that day. Oh. And so we each got three minutes and I am quite wordy. So the three minutes was a challenge for me. And to this day, my, my siblings will, when I start to tell a story, they'll go, is this a red line, green line story? Because I told this one story, which everyone remembers, which I think is good, about a gym class where the gym teacher was blowing the whistle and we had to run to various lines in the gym. And so to this day, I mean, I'm 59 and my siblings will be, I'll start to talk and they'll be like, oh, is this a red line, green line story? Um, So I'm known for being wordy. Um, But I did also learn that, you know, how to talk in front of an audience. My audience was my family. I learned how to distill a story down to three minutes, which came in handy when I started storytelling in my fifties. And, um, it also, how to keep someone's interest, you know, and, and how to keep an audience with you as you tell your story. So I, I went off to Smith college, um, part for a number of reasons. Um, I was a super nerd. But also because I actually had some, um, I had a stalker and I wanted to get away from men, which sounds, I mean, happily married. But real. Not not bad. I'm not, it's not, I'm not anti-men. But um, 
Yeah. So I ended up at Smith and that was a really great experience as a young woman to be in an environment where women were not only expected to do everything, we we were doing everything. The president of the student body was a woman. Every woman who spoke up in class, every person who spoke up, up in class was a woman. Um, and so you, you just, I kind of, it was almost like being soaked in that. And so when I left, I, I never thought twice about speaking up because I've been speaking up for four years. And I love that about that experience. It's not for everyone, but for me, it was wonderful. And yeah. um, and then I started, as you mentioned, I started working in neuropsych research after I graduated. So, okay. So, okay. I want to know why psychology? I am fascinated by how people become who they are, how they think, how they behave, not only individually, how individually we behave, but how we behave collectively. And that has always been really interesting to me, how we're impacted by the people around us and how that changes us throughout our lives. That's always been super interesting to me. And so for me, psychology was, it, it wasn't even really, my first psych class, I remember thinking, this is it. Like I, I had no doubts that it was the right major for me. And I still am, I, I'm the kind of person who's sitting in a coffee shop trying to figure out what's going on in their relationship? Um, <laughs> I do the same thing. Oh my. <laughs> so, so I want to ask though, because in your bio, it said you did all of this research and stuff while you were having children. How many children do you have? I have two I have children two. and a stepchild. Yes. Okay. And so tell me how that was working. How were you balancing this marriage, these children and this work? It wasn't easy. I, I think that um, I, I was at a, I was on a podcast with some of my Smith alums um, from my class, just like last month, I think it was. And we were talking about, we graduated, I graduated in 85. And in the 80s, women were being told that we could have it all. Mm -hmm. And it was daunting in a way, because <laughs> no matter what you did, you weren't doing it all well. It's, that's how it felt. It felt like you're being pulled in so many directions. And we've moved a long way from this. But back then, there was still an assumption that the woman was the primary caretaker of hearth and home, right? And so you're, you're trying to explore your own potential, but by the same at the same and make a difference in the world. And at the same time, you're trying to balance that with being a a good mother, a good spouse, a good daughter, a good friend. And it was very, very hard. And as it was a struggle, I worked full time until my son was born. At the time we were living in Switzerland and I had this experience while I was pregnant with my son, where I was in Austria at a business meeting. My husband was in Japan at a business meeting and our daughter was in Switzerland with an au pair from Chile. And I thought, this is cool, but it's also impossible. This is not the family that I envisioned. And when I was growing up, I had, I, my mom worked the whole time I was growing up. She was a school teacher. And so it fit really well with family because we went to the school she taught at. So we were with our, our mom all the time. But for me, being away from my kids and trying to balance that was really, really difficult. So I ended up consulting for a number of years after my son was born and didn't really go back to work full time in that area until they were in high school. And so there was a period of about 10 years where I was a full time volunteer. It's like I, I like to put it. I was a professional volunteer. Uh, you, you know, my husband used to say to me before I left the house, sit on your hands, because <clears throat> as soon as somebody would say, we need somebody to do X, I'd be like, oh, I'll do it. <laughs> well, you know, <laughs> what I love about this is, is that. Um, so many of us were brought up in that field where it was like, you can do it all. You can have it all. You can be it all. But nobody says, but in the midst of this, how do you take care of you? Mm -hmm. How do you be present with mm -hmm. the people that you love? Mm -hmm. And so I think it's fabulous that you caught it. Mm -hmm. and made that decision. Tell me where, 
writing came in? So I've been writing my whole life. Um, I started with like so many young girls with a little pink diary. You know, it was like that puffy kind of vinyl Mm -hmm. diary with a little key. And I locked it and hid it because I thought everyone was going to be fascinated by what I had to say (laughs) at seven. You know, Um, I was leading a fascinating life at seven. But um, and then I graduated to, you know, these fabric little journals and then Moleskines. And I've commented on my own life pretty much my whole life. But I didn't start writing until my kids were in college. And I knew that there were some things I wanted to address, things that I felt no one was talking about. And this was, you know, even though it was only, what, 15 years ago, I guess? No, a little longer than that. 13 years ago? There were still a lot of things that we are now discussing openly that weren't being discussed um, mm-hmm. in the early aughts. People weren't talking openly about mental health the way they do now. People weren't talking about miscarriage the way they do now. People weren't talking about a lot of things that women deal with day in, day out, and had to keep to themselves. And I was struck. Um, I had an experience in my own life that was one of those things that you just never imagine happening to you. It's the thing of, it's the thing of movies. Um, my stepdaughter's mother died of a heroin overdose Mm -hmm. and she was living out here in California. My stepdaughter was living with us at the time because of her mom's um, struggles. And my husband and I had to go to the medical examiner's office. And then we had to go to her apartment and there's still the yellow tape was still up. And my kids, I'd asked a friend to take my kids after school, my two little ones. And I'm dealing with how are we going to, um, talk, you know, how do we, how are we going to be talk about this with my stepdaughter? She already knew, but we were like, how are we going to help her through it at the same time, dealing with the actual nuts and bolts of that day? How are we going to tell our own kids who are really young about what's going on? And that night I was uh, on the PT, PTA board and I had an event that I'd planned and I had to go to. And I remember showing up and having people say, hi, how are you? And me saying, I'm fine. How are you? I'm great. And I just remember thinking to myself during that, that event, like I'm living this like double life, the real life that I'm living in here. And the one that I'm explaining outwardly. And as I got to know, um, we were new to the neighborhood. And as I got to know people and felt more comfortable talking about some of the things that were happening in my own life, I realized that every time I opened up to someone, they felt free to open up back. Not always, of course, because not everyone is in that space yet. But by sharing my struggles, I allowed other people to admit that they had struggles too. And to me, that's always been one of the main things that's come through in my writing is an openness that because I want people to feel they're not alone. Yes, absolutely. So that's sort of where that all kind of, and so I started writing, I um, I actually, my very first writing work was in a hush bar. I told the story about my stepdaughter's addiction issues and the struggle for families in dealing with someone when someone you love is struggling with something and you can't make it better. Right. And from there, the next story I told was about my mom's Alzheimer's and my father's difficulty in accepting that that was what was happening and develop my own embarrassingly slow empathy for him in and my own fears of developing the, that illness as a young woman, because my mom was diagnosed when she was just over 60. And the next one was about when I had a psychotic break because of an insomnia induced thing that happened my junior year, when I went to Stanford, uh, there was, uh, and I realized that every single story I was telling was dealing with something difficult, something people didn't talk about. And after I would tell a story, everyone, not everyone was, you know, in the hushed bar, it's because you're supposed to be quiet. It's not because my work is so amazing that everyone's hushed. But afterwards, in, in every single time, someone would come up to me and say, oh my gosh, that happened to me, or this happened to me. And it reminded me of that. And I, I had one time I t- after I told the story about my insomnia and the stress of trying to be a perfect um, leading to this break, someone chased me out of the bar calling my name. And I thought that they wanted to talk about that story, but it turned out they wanted to talk about the story about my mom's Alzheimer's. And yeah. they were like, listening to you change the way we were dealing with my grandmother. 
Wow. And I t- went home, I told my family, we had an open discussion about it. And we all realized that we were not being open with her about something that was her illness. And so things like that, I think it's just little moments that give you this boost that says this is I'm on the right track. And wow. Well, what's yeah. interesting about this is that isn't it fascinating how your interest in psychology somehow infused with your storytelling and your writing and and wanting to invite people into their authenticity. Absolutely. So tell me about Blurred Fates. So Blurred Fates came from that same that that same experience of this wow the life that I'm leading is not the life that people think I'm leading. And I lived at the time in a community that had a number of gated communities where everything in Southern California and gated communities looks amazing, right? The flowers are blooming all the time. Everything's, the women are all beautiful. And I I just felt like I was leading a double life. And I also realized that so many times when you're standing at Starbucks and the person behind you is behaving in a way that you don't understand, you have no idea what they're going home to. You have no idea what's going on in their minds at that moment. And if we could all give each other a little grace um, in life, that it would be helpful. So the book I wanted to write was about a woman who seems to be living this perfect life, but who has hidden some really dark secrets and hidden them from everyone, including herself, which is often the case for people who have dealt with trauma as kids or as young adults. They, They often can't even address it in their own minds. And then she's triggered by something that happens. And the rest of the book is sort of her, it's told in first person. So you're in her head and you get to see how she navigates facing the struggles that she has put aside. It's beautiful. So that's what it's about. And the title comes from the idea that the whole nature and nurture debate, like what is it that makes us who we are? And I realized that, first of all, we're not fated to be in my opinion, we're not fated to live a certain life. Um, And that if we were, that fate would be blurry. We wouldn't be able to figure it out until we were living it. But also that our fates are so tied together. Again, that collective stuff that goes on in, in, in our world, that my behavior is impacted by your nature nurture, by my best friend's nature nurture, um, and it's like this whole mix that's that's forming us constantly as we as we live. So that's really what the book is about. It's it's funny because when some of my initial readers, they were like, oh, my gosh, this is one of the best psychological thrillers I've ever read. And I'm like, I didn't write a psychological thriller. But that's what it sort of turned into, because there's so much uncertainty in her head as she's processing that you're turning the pages to find out what she learns about herself. Um, so that's what well, it's, I hope that was helpful. Well, no, I, no, I, I, I just think it's, it's, it's exquisite, but I, I want to say this is your first novel. Mm-hmm. how do you know how to do that? I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. First of all, I want to tell everyone out there. It took me about nine months to write the first draft, but it took me 10 years to get it published. Why? Um, Partly because um, I was learning as I went. And I think as someone once told me, writing your first novel is like getting an MFA in creative fiction. You, you, you can't, you learn to write the novel while you're writing the novel. It's almost like an educational experience. And, well, it is an educational experience, not almost like. It mm-hmm. is an educational experience. I was fortunate to have a number of, um, I had a village of, of supportive writers around me. I was a member of a reading critique group that met weekly. They shared my journey with me. My sisters are both really supportive. My kids are supportive. My husband's supportive. Um, and then I got involved in So Say We All, telling these stories that it's, the way it works for them is that you you write to a prompt at the beginning of the month. They put out a prompt. You write to that. It's a five-page story, roughly. There's a jury, um, a blind jury that selects seven of the stories that have been submitted They assign you a writing coach and a performance coach. And by the end of the month, so two weeks later, you tell the story out loud in a bar. Great. And so I started doing that. That helped with my storytelling 
style. It helped me to learn a lot of just the basics of storytelling, arcs and beginning, middle, end, and all of those kinds of things, which I was then able to put into work or put into practice while working on my novel. I did put the novel aside for a full three years. I just put it in a drawer thinking that was my education. And now I'm going to write another one. And then I was at an event, a writer's conference in La Jolla, and I read part of it for a, a workshop on voice and developing your voice, finding your voice. And when I was done reading the first three pages, the all the people in the room started clapping and said, when is it coming out? And I was like, oh, it's never coming out. It lives in a drawer. And they said, no, 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 pull it out. And I did. And I don't want to make it sound like that was it. And it got published because I then worked with a developmental editor who sent me six pages, single spaced of things that needed to be fixed. I made all those changes and I sent it out to a new round of beta readers. I got their feedback. I edited, it was copy edited. I, I it, It's a long, long process, but it's so worth it in the end to hold your book in your hand and to think that your words might impact people's lives that you'll never yes. meet. Yeah. Well, what I love about this, Anastasia, is that what... What you are saying really applies to anything in life, you know, whether it's writing a book or painting or creating something new, that whole creative journey is a learning for the person who's in it, but it's also an opportunity to touch other people's lives. Mm -hmm. So I want to know, you're the director of this festival, and we were talking before the recording started what is the festival and why do you do it the way you do it? So the San Diego Writers Festival was started about five years ago. Um, two women, Jennifer Thompson and Marnie Friedman, started it with the with they had three goals. One was to put San Diego on the literary map to let people know there's so much great writing coming out of San Diego. Um, secondly, they wanted to bring together all of the literary organizations that exist in San Diego and let them know about each other to build a real community of organizations. And that has, we've been, we've been so happy with how that's been going. I mean, we, at our last festival, we had representatives from the San Diego Writers and Editors Guild. So say we all, um, the San Diego Film Consortium. I mean, just so many people came and were involved on panels and workshops. We, and the third goal was to make it free and accessible to everyone. Sorry, I should go through go through the three goals before I move on. The so many writers festivals have a high cost of you know for people. Many many writers are struggling, and many writers have a, a career that they're doing during the day, and then they're writing in their free time, and so they don't have. So we make this a one day festival. It's starts in the, it's from you know nine to six and everything is free to the public. So we had at our last festival so many of our events were standing room only and it was phenomenal. The, the number of people that came up to us and said, I never have been to the, something like this before. I couldn't afford to do this. This has been wonderful to be able to do this. And so we're really, really happy with how that's going. Our next one will be in April of 2024. And um, we're already starting planning for it. And we bring in some big authors. Um, we've had James Patterson. We've had Lee Child. We've had Tayari Jones, who was amazing. Um, we try to also look for people who are just starting out in their careers, emerging writers. Um, we do obviously focus on local writers as well to give them an opportunity and a platform to get their work out into the world. We had a, a great, um, this past year we had, Jesse Leone, who wrote I'm Not Broken, which is a fantastic memoir. And he's just, he's this teddy bear of a guy. And just, I mean, I can't, I could go on and on about the amazing authors that have given their time to us because we can't pay people very much because we have no money. Not charging. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, you know, people just, yeah, I, it's, it's, the energy is fantastic. And everyone is, is giving and we're, it's an all volunteer organization. So we give our time and it's, it's been an, an incredible growing opportunity for me. And I think for the community. So, well, I think that that's lovely and it's, it's so in alignment with who you are and what lights you up. How do people find you? 
So my name is kind of a, a humdinger. Um, it's AnastasiaZadike.com. It's all one phrase, um, no period or anything. And it's um, you can find information about the festival. You can find videos. There's 10 videos of performances I've done um, for So Say We All. You can find the other books that I've, uh, I have things in anthologies. You can find those on the website. And um, yeah, I hope that people will... It, the stories there are, I don't want to make it sound like all of the stories that I tell in the bar are dark because many of them are funny and some of them are bittersweet. Um, so I encourage people to, if you have 10 to 12 minutes to just, you know, you want to like search around on YouTube. Um, it's all on YouTube as is your podcast. So YouTube is a font of a wonderful material. Um, so I hope people will come and, and visit the website and see what we're all about. Well, I love that. Well, I ask the same last question of every guest. This show is called Women Awakening. What do you think is the most important thing about Women Awakening at this moment on the planet? This is such a great question. Um, Thank you for that. I think that... I, I just recently, through Smith, was able to watch a pod, um, a, a, a perf- I wouldn't say a talk. It was a talk by Kyra Jewel Lingo, who has a book out called "We Were Made for These Times," mm-hmm. and it's ten lessons in how to resource yourself. And I think that one of the things, so that you can be present for whatever comes your way, and one of the things that I've learned throughout my life is the strength of women. Women, not to be crude, but there's an essay that was in Mick Sweeney's a while back called Anything You Can Do, I Can Do Bleeding. Mm-hmm. And I just think women have such power. We we give life. We nourish life. We are there for each other. Our shoulders were made for not only babies to cry on, but our girlfriends to cry on, our family members to cry on. We are, but we, we are not just strong in ourselves, but we're strong collectively we're there for each other you're here for me allowing me to be here and talk with your audience that kind of thing is is giving women strength from within from without and i think we're learning that we can do this not just because we're strong on our own but because we're strong together yes. and i and i love i love hearing stories about that. I love hearing the stories of how women have uplifted each other. I think that we are also at a time where there's a recognition that we don't have to do it all. And that the men in our lives and the other people in our lives, that it's that they're learning that it's their role too. And I think that that's opening up opportunities like for my daughter I'm so thrilled that she has a partner who's supportive of her and recognizing that he can be a caregiver that he can and that there's a gift in that right um so I think that women it's an it's a challenging time to be in the world but it's also a super exciting time because I think the women of this generation um that are just coming into their own have opportunities we didn't have but also the women like me, who I'm turning 60 this year, I still feel like there's so many opportunities opening up for me too. Um, and, and that's just, it's, I think we all are awakening women. We're, we're coming into our own. It's, a, it's, a, it's an, it's a, it's a, it's a process that's going to be ongoing forever. Right. But, um, but I really feel like that now I feel like so many podcasts are by women for women. It's, we have such opportunities now, and I hope that people see that and grab at it. Take the, take a chance. Well, thank you so much, Anastasia. I just think you're beautiful. You're smart and you're passionate. And I'm grateful that you were here today with me. Oh, Cynthia, thank you so much for having me. This has been wonderful. And thank you for what you're doing for women and and men. I hope there's some men watching. (laughs) (laughs) I think there are. (laughs) So so ladies, you're welcome. Ladies, I want to say the same thing I say to you every week in a different way. What a 
if you knew you were here for a reason? What if you knew you were powerful? What if you knew that only you could do what you came here to do? No one else could do it the way you came here to do it. What if you knew that? What if you were so sure of how powerful you are that activating the courage that lives within you would be effortless because you would know you were needed and essential? I'm going to ask you this week to contemplate that, knowing how amazing you are, how dynamic you are, how mighty you are. I'm grateful to serve you. I hope you will come back every week and meet another incredible woman because it's our time to be on this planet. 